Welcome to the Sanctified Mind Podcast. We are here with another book review. If you watched our last one, you'll have seen Wes, but he's here with us again uh, reviewing another book. Hi, Wes. Hello. Glad he to has be here. a white streak in his hair. If you watch the video, you could see it. Yeah, you might have to zoom in. It might be hard to see. I don't I know. I don't think you're going to have to zoom we in. We need a better quality camera. So, <laughs> Anyways, we are reviewing William Wilberforce Real Christianity. This book was written in, does anyone know? Seven, 1797. 1797. And at the on the front of the book, it says that this is the book that helped end slavery in England. Um, and so it talks a little bit about the guy, and he was integral in, in pushing against slavery and, you know, saying that it was a, you know, wicked thing and that uh, Christians should not partake in it. And this book and his efforts did contribute to, and I think, you know, England is a much better model for how they got rid of slavery than America. That's another right. discussion. Um, but it, what I found extremely interesting reading this book is that the book that is credited helping in slavery in England never once mentioned slavery or race in the whole entire book. That is fantastic. It, isn't that it's so interesting that that, that that is? And it's because all he talks about in the book is being a Christian, living on- a, a, you know, believing the gospel and then living a Christian life. I, I thought that that's just uh, what a what a breath of fresh air this book was after the woke church book to me. It's as if the gospel is in itself a transformational power in the culture that doesn't need any other help. Wild concept. Interesting theory, Bo. Interesting. Yeah. Does anyone know, um, did you guys read the introduction that actually explained his past, Mr. Wilberforce? He was if, a slave if, trader, yeah. right? No, he was not. Oh. So basically he was a commoner for the first 20 years of his life after college. He entered politics and from what I remember, I think this is correct, but he wasn't a Christian when he entered politics, became a believer um, while he was in politics, and then wrote about being a believer a- as a politician. Um, I don't think this is the only book he wrote. It may be, but I don't think it is. If not, he wrote a bunch of um, essays, I guess you could say, if, if that's what you call them back in the, the 18th century. Yeah, but, he wrote a bunch of like littler books, I guess, yeah. but this is his, so, I guess, yeah, main he, one. He wrote a lot about living a Christian life as a right. politician in England. That's pretty unique. Um, I'm trying to remember anything similar today, yeah. and I know that the only thing that I can remember recently was a um, prosperity gospel preacher who realized he was peddling a false religion. And You convert- talking about uh, Costi Hen? Benny Hinn's nephew? My, my, is he a big guy? Yes, he's yeah. actually pretty big. Yeah, SM, yeah. pretty yeah. big that's SM, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, so yeah. it says here in the Ford, it says he was active in educational reform, prison reform, the promotion of public health, health initiatives, and advocating for shorter working hours and improving conditions in factories. So I think that's interesting because that is what we would say is more like what a liberal does, which is, um, you know, why I uh, kind of may tend that direction in this kind of sense. Um, what you talking about? Well, these things that we would say, oh, these are like liberal platforms is stuff that, you know, he thought as work, like, you know, a Christian should be doing in government is working for the good of the public and the good of people. But his, again, his backdrop was because he was a Christian, he was just trying to live out his Christianity. So this book starts, he talks about the, you know, current ideas about the nature of man, understanding cultural Christianity. So that's the main uh, thing he talks about in the entire book is this idea of cultural Christianity. This idea of a Christianity that is um, just outward, right? And I think reading the death of Christian Britain, which covered yeah. little... I mean, this kind of helped me understand that, where he was saying, like, oh, Britain is in dire straits because ever like, you know, the majority of people are just cultural Christians. They're just doing Christianity on the outside. It doesn't touch their lives. It doesn't impact who they are, their inward life, or, you know, what they do with their time, their money, you know, how they, you know, what things they pursue... Uh, Christianity is not really an all enveloping thing to them because they don't really know Christ, right? Um, so I think that kind of explains where, I mean, he's kind of prophetic reading this and then reading that other book we read, Death of Christian Britain, where basically uh, Britain declines and it looked like a lot of there was a lot of outward Christianity there, cultural Christianity, which is, you know, kind of scary for America because I think we have kind of the same thing going on here. But he really drives home the point that there is a marked difference in the lives of someone who claims to be a Christian 
And, you know, we know most people in America would claim to be Christians, right? But, you know, they don't go to church. They don't, they're not, their lives are not transformed by the gospel. So he really hammers home that if you're a Christian, sanctification, sanctification comes along with it, right? And so how we live our life is different now. We are changed. Um, and if you're not changed, then you're probably just a cultural Christian, which is to say not a Christian at all, right? Yeah, I definitely think that uh, I agree with you that reading Death of Christian Britain would have paired very well with this book um, because the nominal Christian is certainly the target. The idea of a, of a Christian who is, who is one culturally, um, who is by virtue of their parents being in the church, having been you know, baptized in the church, but having no actual fruit of sanctification in their lives, not having Christianity actually impact their lives in a meaningful way. Um, that seemed to be the target of what Wilberforce was talking about. And if you think about that in terms of what he was combating um, in the slave trade, I mean, we know, I mean, I, let's be clear, all of us here would say that racism is a very real sin um, and that, you know, we see it in our past, in our in our history, um, in this country. And it, it, sh- it was a black eye, a, bl- a blindness that people suffered to not be able to connect those dots. And I think that cultural Christianity really... Um, is half of the reason why those dots weren't connected Um, because it was the idea of, of course, we're Christian. We are a Christian nation. We go to church. We do, you know, we, you know, we, we even probably believe the Bible is the word of God, but we don't necessarily have that impact our lives on a meaningful level um, or at least in certain areas of our lives. You know, even if, if every other impact, every other aspect of your life is impacted, you know, you don't, you don't run around on your wife. You're not a drunkard. You don't beat your kids. Um, you know, you're not getting into brawls in the streets, but you actually believe that there's this entire group of people made in the image of God that are subhuman, that they are, they are just basically higher forms of animals and you don't really have to give an account to God for how you treat them, um, or the, the status in life that you give them. I mean, I think that's a a very real, um, consequence of nominal Christianity. I think he does a very good job of attacking that and been pointing out to the fact that the gospel really does impact a person's heart um, in a meaningful way that brings real change in their lives to where that they progressively over time see those blind spots of sin in their lives and they seek to mortify that. You know, they're never going to do it perfectly, but they're going to continually try to do that as they go along. Yeah, and so again, he never mentioned slavery, though, in this book at all. But why this book, I think, contributed to the ending of slavery in England is because if people are living as true Christians, then eventually, you know, as if Christians are living like that in the culture and in in their lives, then eventually slavery has no place there, right? And so eventually, and you know, we look at a lot of the, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but a lot of the Southern generals and things saw slavery coming to an end in America and stuff. So um, because of that very reason, because Christianity was going to force slavery out because the two couldn't co- co- you know, coincide, coexist um, when people the majority of the people are serious about their christianity uh and so his driving force was hey if you're a christian you need to take your christianity seriously right so was wilberforce reformed do we know that there's not a whole lot of indication from the book whether he was reformed or not he, but so he he says some uh ri- he quotes some puritans he said he richard baxter was like a right. treasure that everyone should yeah. read so i i would at this time, he would have li- more than likely been reformed. I think Baxter was an Amaraldian, though, right? I think 18th century England was very reformed. Was very reformed because it's, you're, you know you're, you're not too far, uh, you know you're not too far, uh, uh, divorce, you know, far away from the Westminster Confession, right, and all that influence. So, it, some stuff that he, he he wrote and authors he quoted leads me to believe that he probably was but no and, he was not an Almeridian. and i oh, think his talk of provenance is a lot of yeah. has a lot to do with his his theological viewpoints on some things that doesn't necessarily mean he was reformed but given well, the definition of well at least what people think today and even i guess in the 18th century england talk of provenance is pretty rare so the reason i asked was i remember just back to the forward of the previous book where ligon duncan's basically laying a charge against the reformed people saying that you know our nation would be in a significantly better state if the quote reformed community in america in the 19th and 20th century had simply simply rightly applied the second great commandment and here we have an example of a reformed individual seemingly who has produced a work 
based on the gospel that has ended slavery without mentioning it. I mean, that's a pretty significant contribution to church history that we would not want to overlook. But that wouldn't pair well with a book about the woke church. I guess that's true. That would disarm so the Lagan woke Duncan's movement before it got started. Book in the future. Ligon Duncan. Okay, let's... Can we at least talk about Ligon Duncan? This? Sorry. <laughs> um, Ligon Duncan... I, I have a lot of respect for Ligon Duncan. He's PCA, guys. That's... So he baptized his babies? He did. Um, did. But I actually read an article about this, his forward in the book, um, Woke Church, and how he didn't realize that's what, what he was subscribing to. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't necessarily have to talk about that. But um, going back to real Christianity, I think yeah. um, it's it's a huge huge idea that this guy who entered politics as a I don't know if he entered politics as a Christian if he did great if not he became a Christian after even better but the fact that this guy in politics is is living a life uh, according to what the scriptures say you should live the life as causing something so great as to end slavery in a nation um, speaks huge amount of volume of what God can do if a Christian ever has a um, a desire to serve in politics. Definitely. So at the very end of the book, and I just read it this morning, so that's why you talking about this made me think about this. He says, you know, some people might think I'm arrogant for taking on the role of a spiritual teacher because he says that multiple times throughout the book because he's a politician. He's not a pastor, right? Right. Um, and he says, however, I have simply attempted to execute the proper responsibilities that accompany my office in the government to ha- take a hard look and evaluate the state of religion and morals in our country. Well, it makes I mean, me... Yeah, it makes... Wow. That's, that's really good. And it makes me think about how many people were praying for him at the time, you know, in all of those scriptural commandments that we should pray for our leaders, how many prayers might have contributed towards the changing of his heart? Even in today, you know, in America, where we have leaders that we don't necessarily want, uh, we should still be praying for them, hoping that God changes their hearts so that the gospel can be brought to full effect in our culture. Yeah, definitely. So there's a couple more things I wanted to highlight in the book. Uh, as I was reading it, I was like, I got to like check the front cover to make sure that uh, Paul Washer didn't write this book, <laughs> but he definitely read this book. Paul Washer definitely read this book. I mean, l- let me read this to you and, and and see if this sounds like Paul Washer. Imagine right? it in his voice. Yet what we see today in Christendom is a practice of Christian faith that often, often produces no greater morality than that practiced by those who categorically deny the essentials of the Christian faith. Something is obviously wrong here. Personal pleasure and personal peace become the regulators of where we live, where we work, how we spend our time, what we think, what we say, and how we amuse ourselves. The great issues of our life becomes boredom. What a tragedy. That sounds, that's just so Paul Washer. Uh, This very much sounds like Paul Washer. And there, that, that, that specifically that, that I just read was probably the most convicting thing to me in the whole book where he says personal pleasure, personal peace, become the regulators of where we live, where we work and how we spend our time. Um, Because man, if that's not true uh, to a large extent about even us, you know, I know for myself, like how often do we think about um, things other than personal peace and personal prosperity when making decisions about where we live, where we work, you know, how we spend our time and things like this. And this is how we should spend our time at the very end of the book. He, he sums it up with, you know, uh, I care about humanity. He says, I, I wrote this book because I care about humanity. I'm telling you these hard truths because I care about humanity. Um, and as he talks about in the book, like, you know, this is what true love is, is to tell people that, hey, you know, this is... What is this, a shocking Brit message or yeah, something? Right, that's, <laughs> that's why I could just see Paul Washer saying it, like, this is him being loving. <laughs> this is what love is, is to tell, tell people the truth that, you know, this life is not it, right? This is this is not it. Like, we're not seeking, uh, you know, the, the end goal is not race, racial reconciliation on earth, right? We are all working towards and you know striving towards we're we're pilgrims on a journey to somewhere else and you know uh being overly concerned with this life as a christian is just uh not what we're supposed to be doing right i mean it doesn't mean that you don't have cultural implications or that the second great commandment is not the second great commandment you still live out your life as a light who shines before others and 
help those in need. Sure. But it's always with an eye to eternity, right? I mean, Absolutely. that's, that's with the ultimate goal. The ultimate end is not this life. I mean, this, this life is but a blip in our existence, right? Well, let's get into that and the discussion. So and if y'all don't have anything else, the other part I really liked was the section three when he talks about the concern about what people think about us compared to the attitude of the authentic Christian. Um, and I just read this blog by Doug Wilson on scorn and men standing in the face of scorn. And I think because th- this is what he talks about in section three. I mean, and that's another thing I was struck with by this book was like, wow, this could have been written yesterday. I mean, this is so like he even talks about how like people are so concerned about physical fitness that it's become a, a sensual endeavor. People being so concerned about their bodies and getting in shape. I was like, is this 2020? You know, it's just, it, it was amazing. But he talks about scorn about uh, basically caring about what people think. And I think that that's what's coming in the church. That is what's that is the the battle the church is going to have to fight as far as standing for the truth is the, the battle against scorn, um, being scorned by the culture, being scorned from people within the church. You know, you believe that about men and women. You know, you believe that about the gospel. Like, that is the battle that we are going to have to fight in the future. And, and Doug Wilson just wrote a blog about it men you know where are the men who are going to stand against scorn and not fold over because they're scorned by the earth and i think we don't really understand the pressure of that yet hey you know my oh it's just scorn like but when everyone and i think i've seen a little bit of it with the mask thing like being the only one without a mask in a store like you kind of feel it i mean you kind of and i think that's coming to the church not not the mask thing specifically but just scorn is something we're going to have to face and we're going to have to not care about what men say and care about what God says, uh, more Amen. than the opinions of men. So anyone else have anything about the book? It's free online. Uh, if you want to take your time <laughs> reading it, I would go, no, seriously. Is that's the abridged, uh, that's awesome. the abridged vision. I, free, I actually bought no. this book. So it was well, not, good the, to know that it's, it's free not online. the abridged version though, or it's yeah. not the modernized version right. so, online. So yeah. it'll be a little bit more tougher reading. Let me say, I did not actually finish this book because I bought the, the Kindle unlimited Every cheap repented. version yep. and, um, hmm. not, not yet, but I plan on finishing it. Okay. Uh, but it is it is a pretty difficult read. I would have I wish I'd gotten the paper copy in the modern language. I think I could have breezed through it a little faster. Um, Wilberforce is a uh, not an easy read. I'd never heard of him out in theological terms. He's not a you know it's weird. We just talked about John Owen. I thought after reading John Owen's book that you know there's nothing that could have shocked me. No, but the, he was the paper book is not a hard read though. You just read the wrong one. Right, this is yeah. not a hard read. No, this 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 is but. This is a summary of, of what his original version was. So, uh, but I, I really would recommend getting the paper book. I intend on buying it and probably reading it um, early in January. Uh, I, I really appreciated what I read. I just couldn't finish it. But, Quest, final thoughts? Um, no, I think I've had everything. But it, it was a great book. I enjoyed reading it. Um, honestly, I think he was a little bit repetitive in the whole book he was he was it driving was, it, his, was, it was yeah. very repetitive throughout the whole book but in the end the, the message is clear you have you you as a believer um are given a commandment to love other people and he's telling you how to love other people um in, in a practical sense not just a um theological sense but a practical one as well yeah, I highly recommend the book. This is one of the few books going on to a list of books that uh, I will have my children read. So mm. that's probably the highest recommendation I can give. This book was very convicting to me. It's definitely a book I'm going to read again. And uh, yeah, it was an excellent book. So this is a book that America definitely uh, needs to read more of. Wilberforce and was a tour de force on real Christianity. Boom, boom, oh, well, making dad jokes. Is your wife pregnant? Nine. Wear your New Balance shoes and your blue. <laughs> Wait, no, Daniel wears the blue jean shorts around here. That's Amen. right. That's <laughs> right. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, check out the longer discussion where we're going to talk more about race and the gospel and things involving uh, race and the gospel. So, see you next time. <laughs>